So uh, welcome everyone. My name is Jonathan Foster. I'm the executive director of the Grossmore Institute for Sustainable Tourism, otherwise known as GMIST. And welcome to our first kickoff of this uh, 2021 season of the Sandbox series. And uh, these, as I said uh, in, in some of the email blasts that I sent out, are supposed to be uh, very informal approaches. I call them our barroom chats. And you know, where we're able to bring uh, an individual in, uh, such as Kim, uh, who will be talking today, uh, you know, around the uh, festivals and events piece, um, but allow you to have the opportunity to ask your questions, share some of your insights, and really hopefully, um, you know, have that sort of colleague to colleague conversation that a lot of us have been craving, you know, through this crazy mess of a pandemic that we've been living through. So the way we're gonna do this, before I introduce Kim is uh, we'll do a uh, you know, 15, 20 minute uh, sort of overview of some, some ideas, some innovation, some practices that uh, Kim has have been a part of or has uh, experienced. And then what we'll do is uh, we'll, we'll move it into some, some questioning, some sharing component pieces. Uh, there's a bit of an interactive piece where we're gonna be asking you some questions going out, you know, you know, have you done that uh, sort of, if you have your cameras on, raise your hands and sort of do a thumbs up if she asks you this, or down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see uh, reactions over on the right hand side. If you click that, you could do the thumbs up uh, or clapping hands, whatever you want to do. If you want to ask a question, if you can click that raise hand piece, that would be awesome. Or if you if you don't want to lose sight of the question as someone else is talking or as Kim is talking, put it in the chat box and we'll try to moderate it from there. So we basically have about an hour and 15 minutes or so. Uh, let's jump into this. As I said, these are, are very, very informal and, and uh, Kim has done a great job. We've tested uh, flipping back and forth here between a couple of the uh, slideshows and some of the video pieces that she's going to share. Um, if we do have a little bit of a hiccups, don't worry about it. We'll have conversation while we fix the uh, technical side of things. Um, but other than that, let's get going with this. So I want to introduce you to uh, Kim Doyle, who is a partnership and product development specialist with Whitecap Entertainment. And Anybody that was on the uh, the masterclass that we did on festivals and events with Paul Gudgeon back in the fall, uh, I got all these questions of, could you bring Kim in to, to follow up what Paul did? Because everybody was drawn to all of the creativity and ideas that she uh, shared about what was going on with much of what they had on the go. So that's how this sort of led into to this series. So she's really gonna talk to us about this innovation, adaptation and partnership uh, process uh, where she sees it going and opportunities, you know, through this chaos that we're living in around festivals and events. So Kim, uh, oh, sorry, before I do that, very quickly, um, and this is just who you are, your organization, and where you're from. We have to be super quick with this. I'm going to run through, and just so we all know who's, who's on the call, if you want to put your camera on, that's great. Um, I'll just call out your name and unmute yourself. And we'll do this like real, real quick. So uh, Susie Atwood, I'm gonna start with you. Hi there, uh, Susie Atwood. I uh, work for the municipality of Barrington in Barrington, Nova Scotia. Awesome, thanks. Uh, Kieran? Hi, I'm Kieran Miller and I'm with the town of Sackville, New Brunswick. Thank you, Matt. Hi, I'm Matt Bride and I'm also with the town of Sackville. Thank you. Uh, Nancy. Hi, Nancy Bellavo Poitier with the City of Camelton in New Brunswick. Thanks, Nancy. Ron. Uh, I'm Ron Kelly Spurls. I am also with the town of Sackville, New Brunswick. Uh, Aaron. Hi, I'm Aaron Whitney, and I'm with the Newfoundland Labrador Folk Festival. And Brody. 
Hi, I'm Brody O'Keefe. I am with uh, Whitecap Entertainment as well. Just listening in to my colleague today. Sitting in moral support. <laughs> Sam. Hi, my name is Sam Bosens. I'm the owner of B-Rad Adventures, a mountain biking adventure company in New Brunswick. And I'm also the project manager for Mountain Bike Atlantic, um, uh, supporting mountain biking across all four Atlantic provinces. Awesome, thanks, Sam. Uh, Glenda. I'm Glenda Sims. I'm the tourism coordinator with the city of Cornerbrook. Awesome, did I skip anyone? Nope, all right. Kim, over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good morning. I know it's first start of your day for getting on a Zoom here, but I will probably have enough enthusiasm to talk about events uh, for all of us. So I do absolutely love doing this. Um, I was I was uh, talking to Jonathan after that last GEMA session that he mentioned. Um, uh, it was one of my favorite Zooms that webinars that I participated in. I love the idea of industry in our area, talking to each other, learning more from each other. None of us know what's going on in this COVID world right now, and we need to work better together. So I'm really excited to be here to talk to you all about this and, and have strike up some conversation together. We're gonna go through a little bit of where we were, how we got there, and then a few of our projects that we put together and how they came to be. As Jonathan mentioned, it's very conversational. So please do send in some questions. I'm gonna, rather than just doing like 15 minutes and then go into questions, we'll do questions sort of all, all, all throughout. Um, I could talk all day. So it's Jonathan's job to rein me in. So please do please do submit some questions because this isn't really just about uh, what we do at Cavendish, uh, but maybe just a little bit about me. I am 20 plus years in tourism at the Tourism Industry Association, Tourism Charlottetown, doing a festival of lights, Jack Frost Shellfish Festival. And now I've been with uh, this company uh, doing Cavendish Beach Music Festival for the last 10 years and love every day of it. So as we get into, just trying to do a click here. Um, and who I work for is actually Whitecap Entertainment. So I just want to start with uh, like a hands up quick. How many of you have heard of Whitecap Entertainment? Couple, not many. That's okay because that's our back end company of what we do. So. We do, uh, in addition to large scale events, we've done uh, Rod Stewart at the venue. We do uh, tours. I love the 90s in buildings and whatnot. We did organized logistics for the Royal Visit Canada Day 2014. So you would have heard of our biggest. Hopefully why uh, you're here today is because we're gonna talk a lot about Cavendish Beach Music Festival, which would be our largest uh, event that you are probably aware of. And I just wanted to see kind of a show of hands of any of you have actually ever been to the festival in the past. Not as many, but this is what it looked like before. And then this, what it looks like, this is what we all miss. This is the mass gathering of people. This is what that cow, what was once a cow pasture in 2008 has grown to be the largest outdoor stage in Atlantic Canada, permanent infrastructure, parking, washrooms, internet, the whole thing. So, you know, we have been investing in this venue, investing in festivals and events for many years. And we are not just an event management company. We really are a tourism product development company. So this is our biggest one that we have. Uh, but like I mentioned, we do smaller scale events, conferences, trade shows. So we were hit not just by the large scale, but also into that uh, smaller level. And here we are going into this is like going into our big year. We have been around, we're just coming off our 10 year anniversary. We were sold out. We had it hit over a million dollars in sponsorship revenue for the first time. We were coming off an awesome Luke Bryan show that we put together with the city of Moncton in New Brunswick. We were gearing up for what was going to be the biggest year yet for us. You know, the sky was open. We were not limited. Everything was great. We were on on sale, you know, things were going awesome. We had, we're re-upping partner deals. We had some sponsors who were in the 
the third year, but three year deal had already re-signed and were re-upping in that third year to get more involved with the festival. We were looking at building new infrastructure, like so many things that the world doesn't know because no one had publicly announced. I'm sure you all saw the same things in your world. So many things that we were all going ahead. Let's, let's go, let's grow. And looking to reinvest in our product, not looking at you know, recreating what we are and reinventing what we are. So it was such a shift. And I'm sure like hands up, how many of you were also in that same situation? We're like, this is gonna be a great year. We have a ton going on. And then all of a sudden the world stopped, right? What a difference a week makes. Here's a little run through of what our week looked like. March 6th, Friday, March 6th. Moving into for an event called Cannabis at the Coliseum at the uh, Moncton Coliseum, the first and which is still the last and only one, a uh, 19 plus cannabis themed trade show with a legally operated pop-up shop operated by Cannabis New Brunswick. They have, and it still is, the largest on sale sales day at Cannabis New Brunswick at that store that they've ever had since legalization. Moving into March 6th, great, everything's going great. The only thing we start to see is, man, it's a real struggle to get uh, hand sanitizer in Moncton going around to Staples, going everywhere, going to get some hand sanitizer, extra sanitizer. We had to bring it, someone to bring it over from PEI. And we had an extra cleaning staff on there cleaning. That was really it from COVID. It was like, let's just, you know, let's look like we're doing, doing our part, extra hand sanitizer. And for those of you that have been to trade shows, like those are thinking COVID now, like how would you ever have people up close touching, shaking hands, and then people going and purchasing their cannabis, going outside, consuming their cannabis together is a perfect recipe for what could be a COVID super spreader event. March 6th, that's great. March 7th, event day. It was awesome, sold out. The place was jammed. Any other year you'd be like, rock on. We just had a super successful event. March 8th, Sunday, moving out, moving everything out. There are now a whole bunch of RVs in the parking lot getting ready to move in because there's a giant RV festival coming in that venue this that weekend. March 9th, we have a staff meeting. This is Monday back at the office. Regular staff meeting, COVID comes up. We're talking about it. Like, yeah, it's a, it's a thing. We should really start paying attention. What's going on? Let's see what's happening. March 10th, there was a, the first COVID-19 positive case in Moncton that came in from a flight. The flight was on March 6th coming in from Toronto. There were a few of our delegates on that flight that came to the cannabis at the Coliseum event. So did we ever have a stressful two weeks worrying about, wow, I hope this does not turn into a super spreader event. Thankfully, nothing happened. So we were good. March 11th, as we again, still growing, we were, uh, you know, Brody and I had flights booked that we were going on a best practice mission to Tortuga Festival in uh, Florida. Of course, that didn't happen. We still have travel credits that maybe we will never get to use. But on that day, midweek, we were on our third day of a very intense leadership training that the company put us through that was three months long. Again, everything's still moving ahead. Everything's great. There's a little thing going on here called COVID. Need to be aware of it. But the world is still turning. March 12th happened to be my birthday. I don't know what else happened other than it was my birthday. Skipping over to that, March 13th. For those of you that watched Nova Scotia, like everyone now needs to stay the blazes home. Stay home, don't go anywhere. We were all sent home, you were all sent home. Don't go anywhere unless you need groceries and have someone pick it up and put it in the back of your car. And still to now we've been the last event, massive, massive event at the Moncton Coliseum for a trade show. So we're moving in on a Friday, that's great. Have thousands of people come through. By the following Friday, I'm sent home, Brody sent home, the whole world is sent home to now work remotely and figure this stuff out. How many of you are in a similar boat? Like you were going into that week, everything is normal. And all of a sudden you're paying attention to what's going on out there, not here. That's all out there. It's on CNN. It's nothing that we really need to be overly concerned about here in Atlanta, Canada. So that was our week. That's the 13th, four days later, we are now into our first communication regarding COVID-19. To our customers, to our partners, to our funders, to our accommodation partners, uh, everyone. So this uh, Cavendish Beach Music Festival generates $15 million 
in economic impact, sorry, just, just direct spending every year, $15 million. 10 million of that is from off island visitation. That's, I mean, that alone, gone, right? We are, we are a significant tourism product. So how does that affect a destination like Cavendish, which is very, you know, they have eight weeks to make the sunshine. And now, now what's going to happen? So our first communication went out, which was basically, we're aware, we're watching, and we're 115 days out at this point. We're still going ahead. We're still like, yep, there's still a world where there perhaps could be an event. April 2nd, our second communication about COVID-19. We, at this point, we're, plans are still underway. We're still planning, but please, we know the messaging at this point is to ask everyone to do their part. Stay home, follow your CPHO guidelines, wash your hands. The only way we can all get together is if we all do our part. And that was our big message at that point. Again, that's April 8th. April 28th, dun, 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 the message is out. It is not happening. We are not offer, we are not gonna open the gates this year. We're very hopeful something could happen into the future, but as of now, it's official. We are not opening the festival. We offer people the opportunity to have a full refund. You know, policy is no. There were many other events that did not do refunds, um, but we've kind of seen this movie before. In 2014, for those of you that have been paying attention or lived in Atlantic Canada, we had Hurricane Arthur in July, the first and hopefully last hurricane in July in Atlantic Canada. We couldn't operate on a Saturday. We had no uh, Blake Shelton day. We did have a show Friday. We did have a show Sunday, but no show on Saturday. So we did already uh, see this before. So we did offer refunds and people could also move, keep their tickets, move them to a future event. And if they did that, they would get a $30 credit in what we call beach bucks, which is festival currency, which used to be tokens. We're not sure how that will work into the future, but they're probably gone. So I'll let you know, I cleared this with Brody and you know, we talked about this beforehand because people will want to know, I would want to know. Okay, well, how many? So we had 25% of our audience roll their tickets over. So that's helpful, right? So that just shows the power of the brand and over the years and the trust that was built. Um, and talking about trust, when we do these communications, we were all watching what other events were saying. And we were very strong that we have to be transparent with what we know and what with what we don't know and keep people informed. Those other two communications really didn't say anything. There was no news other than acknowledging what's going on in the world. We're paying attention. We're going to do our very best to deliver something for you. Please stay tuned and, you know, and, and be kind and look after each other. That is April 28th. Then we get into, so now we're at, we're all home. And as we, now this, this is what I've done and I don't think I'm special is, hey, you spend a couple weeks trying to figure this out, this new normal, we're working from home, what do we do? So the first couple of weeks, we're all just like, okay, we're kind of a little bit in shock. Then you start to figure out, you know what? We're really not satisfied with just gonna sit around and cry and be like, well, that sucks. We can't open the gates. Well, what can we do? It's a pandemic. Well, there's always something that we can do. And that's always been our approach is like, what can we do? And the number one thing that I would say that that really worked well for us was, was communicate. And I know some of these things are gonna feel like, yeah, I've heard that a lot, but communicate isn't just sending emails and such. It's actually picking up the phone and calling your folks, calling your partners and like, how are you? A, as a human, as an individual, I know I've seen this. We've all got a little insight into people at their homes. I see many of you here working from home and the odd time I'm home, you hear my dog and all of that. So we really got to a little more humanizing each other and work comes second. Also listening to the partners, like since this is a context of a lot of partnership side is the world changed for our partners too. The world changed for Bell. The world changed for Atlantic Lottery. People aren't going into the corner stores and buying lottery tickets anymore. Well, that significantly changed for them. So in talking with them to hear what their problems are, so then we can try to develop that into, okay, what can we do to help you? So you cannot over communicate ever, but during this time, I would rather get two phone calls over two months from someone than none at all. Participate, spent so much time on any industry webinar thing that I could 
get my hands on of what's happening, what are other events doing, uh, how can we just stay on top of what may, may be changing, and even other jurisdictions and guidelines and what's opened up and what can what can we then bring to the table here in Atlanta, Canada, and then educate ourselves, but also then looking at how can we be a part of a solution and educating people and that there is this is going to be a new normal, that we are going to need to get out of our homes and do some stuff, but how can we do that safely? And then we think back to why do we do these mass events? Why do people go to events? Anyway, like why do they do that? What is their internal reason for why they do that and why they love that? And it's for creating that community and that connection and how I know I've gone to festivals myself that I have not even watched the show. You're there with your friends. You're there with the camaraderie. It's like, how do we recreate that without having a Luke Bryan, without having a Taylor Swift or someone? How do we really create that community? Because we have grown to have, like, we have 70,000 people just on our email list who have opted in to hear from us. They want to connect with each other and not just with us. So being on top of the CPHO guidelines, how can we deliver something within those guidelines? Your public health office is not going to come to you and say, you know what, we think you could do a drive-in. You should go figure that out. Right? They are constantly putting out the guidelines and that's up to us to read them, go through them, interpret them and come up with, throw everything at the wall. It's a state of there's no bad ideas. So go through and say, well, what can we do within those things? How can we keep six feet apart? How can we get people together so they can enjoy an experience together, but not have to touch each other. People are very aware of wanting to be in control of their space and knowing that there, there's no risk of them being in a crowd. And then as a, as a product development company, we felt that how can we create and be and to de, take a leading role in creating a safe, physically distant event? How can we take a leading role in working with CPHO and our suppliers to do something in physically distant events. How can we connect artists to audiences? These artists, I know we'd all love to think that people are buying CDs, and, but they don't buy music anymore. Live events is how artists make their money. And if an artist isn't able to keep afloat anymore, then we lose the culture of the music. We lose the artists and that can only happen, go for so long that people can't pay their bills anymore. The art, artists need the audiences just as much as the audiences love the artists. And then on the partnership side, which is a large part of what I do, and they're a big part of the, of the program we offer is how can we connect our partner brands still to our Beach Bunch community of fans? They don't sponsor us fundamentally just because of the people physically at the gate physically at the venue and when we get into some of what the the program that we actually did oh you'll see some numbers of how many people and how that really changed so we're going to start getting into now uh, some of the actual actual projects we have a few examples of some of the projects but before we get in i just want to loop back in with jonathan to see if there's anything at this point from the audience before we get into the drive-in uh, nothing I see in the chat room, right. um, no hands up, but I think uh, I just want to reiterate uh, what you're saying, Kim, and, and for everyone to be thinking, and I know you you are, but those those public health uh, organization guidelines, I think, are, are key because we always talk about, you know, oh, we need to have these plans and these, these pieces. The public health office has actually done a good chunk of this for us in many ways. They've given us sort of the parameters of how we can exist. We just need to come up with that thought process of, and I think what you mentioned is really key is what is that core experience? What is that purpose for your festival or event? And what do you want uh, a person to experience from that? And that, that's been a hard one, I think, for people to, to really um, define through all of this. So keep on going. Yeah, it's getting back, exactly. Getting back to, Sometimes you get in the years of just doing it to take that step back. This is the time to stay back, take that step back and think, who are we and why do people engage with us? And your talent changes every year. So it isn't just about that entertainment product. The last thing though, you come up with all those great ideas and if we build it, will they come? 
still an unknown, no history, no box office history, no way to tell what's the psychology of folks. Are they ready to get out? But we had to start somewhere. We had to start with something. And this is our first project that we did. So this is the Cavendish Beach Drive-In concert series. Four dates at our venue, uh, which would no normally have a capacity of 25,000 to 27,000, depending on what's their other infrastructure every year. Where for a drive-in, we're looking at, oh, you know, a couple hundred cars, max, no problem. So the infrastructure is all the same, but how you move around now is completely different. So the entrances where you would normally walk in, well, they're now driveways. And how you park, where you would normally line up chairs, well, that's where cars are going to get parked. And trying to figure out that distance to cars to get them turned. And some are coming with big trucks and some are coming with vans. And we even had a couple of RVs. So trying to work out the logistics of that, as well as, of course, your overall public health safety plans. We had food and beverage where you could order on an app. And you can uh, yeah, order the food on the app. It was delivered directly to the car separate washroom facilities, everything was scan tickets, no cash. Communication was absolutely a key here as well. From the time it was announced to all the way through, uh, still using our electronic ticketing system, we use Eventbrite, uh, being able to communicate to everyone what is happening and over communicating it. Highly recommend visuals for that. Physically show me what this is going to be, not just in words. Show me how this safety is going to work. Show me staff in gloves. Show me how this is going to work because I want, I want to feel safe before I even decide that it's something I'm going to consider. Keep in mind, this is still, when we announced this, there was no bubble. Well, this was still just PEI. You look at the lineup that's on there, it's all on island talent. Now, the week before, the Atlantic bubble opened, which was amazing, which then brought us into, we'll say, our partners such as Tourism PEI. So this one was, so partnership is a large part of what I do and used to be called sponsorship. I prefer partnership because sometimes there is no cash. Sometimes it's trades. And this year, more than ever, it was working with all of the partners of what do you, who are you, what has changed for you, what do you need? If I'm RBC, I'm not selling, here's my mortgage rates right now, when people are worried about, am I going to even be able to pay my bills? So they're not advertising the way they were. So we had partners that were involved, such as we'll say, we'll start with RBC, since we just mentioned, they switch gears. And then they developed, they had an RBCX music program, but they were really going hard on this. They're funding artists to get in front of audiences. So how we worked with them is we will take one of your artists, every show that are in your program and feature them on the drive-in, which are also get broadcast on, on a bell show as well. And so they were still involved as a partner with us. We had partners that were signed in multi-year deals and RBC was one who were still able to stick it out with us. And we're like, we are here to help. We know it's not your fault. We will still pay, but we need something for that. And we'll give you some time to figure that out. So we were able to create these new experiences from what they need, but also what they have is some talent and they have a budget to help us promote and get that word out, which saves us a lot of money. And we were able to put that drive in together, incorporating them in the program. Uh, we also had, so Bell, we'll get to in a, in a moment because that kind of grew as something different. You can see that's the Bell branded main stage. Um, but Tourism PEI was a big partner. Tourism PEI, as we are the largest event product in PEI, is usually a partner of the festival. But we are not in a position where we're generating significant off-island visitation with 100 cars, most of them from PEI. But they still need a market as well. And what we were able to bring to tours and PEI that helps them is a broadcast TV show with Bell. So what's in, what does Bell need is they need content. They need to still be connected. They still want the audience to know in Atlanta, Canada, that they are the best use Bell, but not a selly sell of please choose Bell for your mobility service is supporting us, supporting the community, supporting the artists. So we created a Bell TV special with Bell and our partners. 
which aired on July 11th, which would have been the Saturday of Cavendish Beach Music Festival. So that, that date worked out just great for all of us. So on their CTV, so Bell produced the show. We worked with talent. So we got some artists that would normally play the festival or who are on the lineup to send some shout outs, some performances. And then Bell sent through, sent over a TV team. They shot live from the event as well as some of the pre-recorded. We had Shannon Ella from Nashville piped in. And then we had Katie Kelly live in Cavendish. Um, produce, I'll tell you, I never want to produce a TV show again. So that was definitely a lot of stuff. So I wouldn't recommend being involved yourself. But that what also we were able to bring to the table of the TV show, it was really cool. We loved it. It was a great opportunity for the festival. Um, but we're not selling anything right now. I wouldn't buy a TV show. I wouldn't pay for that. There's otherwise no benefit for me. But we're able to get this national three-week pre-promotion, which all of our partners were able to participate in. We had the live TV show, which had 98,000 people watch that show on a Saturday night on CTV2 that normally would have 12,000 people watching a repeat of Corner Gas. So just to say that again, it was 98,000 people watched the TV show live. Back up the bus to how many people we would normally have at the festival. Our capacity is like 25,000. On a you know, regular year, we're at about 20,000. On an awesome year, we're at that full 25. So say on average 60,000 visitors, visitor days over those three days. So if I'm talking to a sponsor and they say, well, Kim, we don't have the, the in-person audience anymore. I'm like, uh, you had 98,000 people actually watch the TV show and a three-week pre-promotion that you own, which also include digital and a whole bunch of things for them. So at the end of the day, we were able to deliver more impressions and more reach. As some sponsors, that's how they're evaluating their partnership. And we're able to educate them on, we can still do stuff for you and you can still engage. So with this London thing with Pure Country Radio, the show aired again on Pure Country Radio the following week. And then we also had this island getaway contest. So the big win for tourism PEI that we were able to negotiate with Bell is we want contesting for a trip to PEI. We want you to send your crew over and do three shots for stories that you can run over the summer promoting PEI as a destination. And then tourism PEI helps us fund the production of the show. So it's cost neutral to us. We all have this awesome show. Everyone's happy on the partner side. And we're able to deliver more of an audience than we would if the gates had opened. So that's just one thing I want to leave you with of thinking about going online and digital with whatever your experience may be, can open up your audience way more than any limitations you would have had before in a physical capacity or travel and accommodations and things like that. So I know I'm getting wanderlust and I, and I spend some time with my husband's Oculus on and go for some various virtual trips to Rome because I'm starting to get some wanderlust. Uh, so during the drive-ins, it's our first time. We've never done this before. We don't know, uh, but we are, we do have a really awesome senior operations team under Brody's direction as well. It works with all the regulatory bodies, our incident command system for the people who want to nerd out in operations is a best practice. We've had other jurisdictions come to the festival and look at how we all work together with these regulatory bodies, the, the RCMP and health and fire took many years to build up that trust, um, but they trust us now that when we want to try things knowing even in a pandemic with all of these rules, we will take safety first and we're not gonna bend the rules. So you're only as good as your last show. And if your last show is a super spreader event, you're done, right? Forget about all your ideas in the world, you are over. Uh, we also, at the end of each show, we sent out a little brief survey to hear. So we're there on one side, right? Behind the scenes looking at it. We sent out a survey to the guests that were there and got their feedback. And then we made tweaks every time. So we did learn for a drive-in on our large show. We tried to do the radio broadcast. However, with the car so close to the stage, you were still getting feedback from the artist monitors. So you would get a little bit of sound distortion. Okay, we learned after that. And then, okay, let's cut the radio and let's just add some PA. That's just not working. But hey, it sounded like a great idea at the time. 
people do that at drive-in movies, but you don't have a live band playing that needs wedge monitors that you can then hear also from 20 feet away. So things that you just learn by doing. And going back to that, will people come? You know, the first night we had 80 cars. Success, anything more than one, we were happy. The next one, 20% more. The next one, another 20% more. And then the last one, whether it was a weather issue, so we had to cancel. But what I would tell you from a partnership perspective is partners didn't want their money back. They knew it was weather. They knew we we're trying. They weren't saying, oh, give me a couple grand back in because that drive-in didn't open. So that was, it's no, it's not a transaction in that sense. And the partners were really a great part of building this together and the trust that they put in us with their brands of knowing that we will deliver a safe event. We will deliver some fun engagement opportunities for you. And we're just so honored that they would trust us with those brands. So before I kind of get on to any of the other sections, I just wanted to pause there for a second to see if anyone had any questions about the drive-in or the TV show, because they're somewhat connected. And it was a lot of late nights of putting all of these pieces together. So this is one of the one of my proud projects from this year. Any questions on that one? No. Well, then you're really going to get excited about this one. Prom. Hey, we have a venue, and high schools weren't able to do their prom, so we have we hosted two proms. Friday night, there, there would be a prom and then everything would get ready the next day for the show. So they were coordinated and scheduled to be the night before a drive-in. So pr the production team is there, folks are there, the parents were able to come in the cars and sit in the cars like the drive-in. And then all the, the graduates were in their dresses and in their suits were able to come up and one by one as a couple and get their photos and up on the stage, had a, a socially distant pizza party. And that was such a big success for them. So did it make us a lot of money? No, but it was really good for the community. So to be able to get even back to the drive-in. So no, it's not $15 million in direct spending, but if we can get a hundred people in Cavendish when you're otherwise doing nothing, well, that's a win this year. That's a big win. The scale of what we would look at at success pre-COVID is digits different than what it is post-COVID. And we're just looking at doing more volume uh, with less of an attendance. Kim, so, did, yeah. Did, yeah. did you guys did you guys reach out to Colonel Gray or did Colonel Gray come to you? They reached out to us, I think, Brody. I, Brody's on here because he really spearheaded that one. We actually, sorry to jump in here, but uh, when it was announced, we started reaching out directly to the Premier's office uh, to see if there's anything mm -hmm. we could do offering our venue. Um, and then we started reaching out to the schools directly um, we reached out to all the high schools and PEI to try and help them out. That's, that's really, really cool. Uh, there was a, a Neptune theater in Halifax did something very similar with their, uh, version of a Christmas Carol. And they reached out with all the school systems in, in Nova Scotia to, uh, beam that as a four, um, a four act, uh, uh, streaming service to all the school kids in Nova Scotia, but it was, it was a school reaching out to them and, and them reaching out to the schools of just, you know, how do we use our venues? How do we use our actors? Uh, I love that. I think it's a, such a cool, innovative partnership that, that, you know, we sometimes overlook those kinds of opportunities. Yeah, it really is looking at what do we have and who could use it and how can we help, right? So uh, it's that that Atlantic Canadian hospitality side of, of that attitude that a lot of that a lot of us have of not being satisfied with status quo and and giving wherever you can. They're like, hey, we have this here. What can we do? Like it was such a fun time. I was Walmart greeter at the gate personally. I absolutely loved it, welcoming all the families come in and you know, I have a child in grade 11 next year. That's going to be me. And I hope he gets to have a graduation and a prom. So uh, it, it was really nice to see that. And, and so many notes of thanks from folks. There's like, thank you so much for doing this. Because any of you that are parents, that's a big deal when your kids graduate in high school. Like, good job on you, parent. You were able to get them all the way through. That's, that's a great parenting. So it was, yeah, it was a smaller type of thing, but really impactful again into the community. 
So we loved, loved, loved doing those ones. So I actually do want to talk about the community. It's probably a good time here to talk about, as I do know that there's some municipalities on here as well, and that we are a private company and, and how that is different, right? So as a municipal organization, as a government owning, operating an event is different than a private company doing it. Um, but we work really closely, we'll say the resort municipality of Cavendish and have since inception. So how things kind of work with us there is we have a, there's that senior operations group, which has 20 some different organizations that meet several times a year. But in addition to that, like we worked with the municipality of how can we use this infrastructure more? What more things can we do? Some of these ideas were then born from that. We did a, a big best practice mission with them a few years ago of how can this infrastructure be best used to grow tourism uh, in for Cavendish as well as for the community and working really closely with them on this drive-in in particular. So Cavendish is, it's different in a sense of a municipality is most of the people that are involved in the municipality do not actually live there. It's mainly a tourism destination, right? So most people are business owners and they're not, we'll say residents, not year round residents. So it's a completely different vibe up there. So trying to do like, we want to now it's COVID, right? Thank you. We're now pitching them. We want to do an event. And many are assuming that it's something large like Cavendish Beach Music Festival. And we're going to try to bring in thousands of people. So working with them on our plans and letting them know that it's going to be safe. And because we've worked so hard over the years of building those relationships and that trust, there wasn't hesitation. They know that and they were involved right, right from all of the planning of how is this going to work? Because uh, it's going to fall back on the tourism destination, a tourism Cavendish Beach, as well as the municipality, if something goes badly. Not just Kim and Brody's phones ringing, they're going to start calling all of these politicians. And we want to be around next year. So you have to be very, very aware of how you're pushing the boundary, but safety first, absolutely all the way. So there was, Brody spent many weekends out in Cavendish where normally he wouldn't spend that much. And I'll tell you, the grass looks better than it ever has, even though there was a bunch of cars on it. And then we're, with working with our partners all throughout the summer to then at this time we're doing the drive-ins, we're still talking about what's next. What can we do next? So let's start getting into the fall. So now we're at the end of the summer. We were able to use that outdoor venue. We're getting into the season where people don't want to get outdoors and do as much. Um, Schools are back open. People are wearing masks. Uh, we're uh, into the fall. Confederation Center was closed. Things start to open up again mid fall. So I know every province is a little bit different, but in PEI, we're starting to get some little more restrictions eased in the mid fall. So, Confederation Center of the Arts and the Hamburg Theater, beautiful world class venue, hadn't been opened in months. Mm -hmm. And normally would have 1,100 seats. All they were able to, they got the blessing to open on a reduced capacity of 300 during this time period. So going back to what can we do? What can we do? And at this point, we had the bubble. So now we can get some talent from who isn't just on PEI. Um, so we had two nights of shows there. So. Uh, Brody was the lead on the operations side here working with the team at Confederation Center. So this is a different situation in that this isn't a venue that we own and control. Um, but if the show goes badly or someone does get COVID, it's still going to look bad on us because we're the promoter of the show, even though we don't have a lot of control over how things are going to work. So working really closely with Confederation Center to develop two shows. Again, it goes back, going back to, we need to build some stuff to get people coming out. It won't be everyone, but some will. They will then tell their friends that it was fine. And then the next round, another 20% will start to come. So it's starting to do some smaller things, get some culture happening again, and working with our partners. In this case, they were you know, supported by the province of PEI and the tourism, sorry, Charlottetown, the tourism accommodation levy. 
So Jen Grant one night, Gordy Sampson the other night, some openers. We also did involve our BCX music in this one with their emerging uh, artist group, was able to have a feature at the intermission. So people are used to going to Confederation Center, going in a certain way, how they operate. Well, this all changed. How you buy a ticket, how you get in, you had to come in a completely different entrance and there was cohorts. So now we're all used to this word cohort. So everyone needed to be no, no more than 50 people sharing an entrance and exit, staggering washroom breaks, staggering things like that, communications. If I wanted, if you want to order a Kit Kat bar and a drink, you order it online in advance and it gets delivered to you. So this was the first real, you know, decent size event happening at Confederation Center since the new restriction. So again, no one had a playbook. It was working with those CPHO guidelines to try to know your venue, know your entrance. Maybe it's usually an emergency exit. Well, now you're able to use it for something else. So how do we move people and keep them separate where they can still enjoy an experience? And people were ready to get out. So we've had our peak of summer and we now had a little bit of months of back in. So into November, so these two shows were, were very successful. Um, there was a round of, you know, things were open, then locked down again, and then open again. So this one timing wise was just by sheer luck, because I think the week after we were in lockdown again, that it actually got to happen. But looking at some of these shows, as you can see, they're not large productions. So we needed to decide to take some calculated risk. Yes, events are risky. Full stop, always. This year, absolutely they are risky. But knowing what are you willing to risk, what can you put on the lines? Okay, if I lost this much, I'm still okay. Sitting around and doing nothing, you will not be around. See, Jonathan, so, comment. So Kim, with, uh, with how you guys planned this, um, you know, because we had, uh, you know, we've, we had a pretty good stretch there and then we sort of hit a little bit of a, you know, rocky bit in the fall. And how did you communicate that out in regards to if, if things did go bad and we had to cancel, uh, was there a communication like, it's almost like as a promotional development piece that full refunds, no problem. Um, and with your, with your acts as well, what was the contractual, if you're allowed to share that, uh, agreements that you had with them as far as if we had to cancel uh, was it a partial payment uh, you know something along those lines I'm going to share something with you on that question so what we didn't talk about so far is the shows we tried to make happen that didn't happen right so I'm going to back up into we tried to do take the drive-in model to Charlottetown in September full support from everyone however the talent didn't want to travel right so and we thought everyone would be excited to come. We can't get the product here. So those things didn't happen. But the new world now is you have to have this, uh, that protection of a refund policy. So the world we are in right now is if the show doesn't happen, you can get your money back. Otherwise, people will not buy in advance. They're going to wait till the day of, see what happens. And I would encourage people are doing that in the accommodation sector. And you need to take that type of risk away from the consumer. They already have in the back of their mind a potential health risk. So they don't want to put the money on the line to not get back. So our policies really right now, right now is if the show doesn't happen due to COVID, everyone gets a refund. And that's sort of the deal with the bands. Like they're not getting paid if they don't work because we're not getting paid and keeping the money, right? So, so what would you say to, um, I mean, because you guys are uh, a bit more cash positive, let's put it that way, than, than a lot of, uh, uh, of the smaller scale festivals and events, you know, and many of us rely on, you know, that Heritage Canada grant and, you know, we're, we're more in that fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollar range than the, the the millions of dollars. But but I like what you're saying is, if we don't take that risk, we lose that ability to stay in front of those audiences, and we risk losing those potential audiences going forward. I guess if we don't adapt and and, and sort of change. So it's one of those things that you know we've had lots of conversations about. And, and many of them being run by volunteer groups, mm -hmm. um, you know, 
what I guess what is your opinion on how much risk risk do we actually need to take here, or is it risk, or is it just evolution within this industry? To be honest, hundred percent. It isn't necessarily financial risk, I suppose, on like what your potential losses, but your time, your resources, and we are going to come out of this. That's what I would like to tell everyone. There will be a world after COVID. There will be, and. We want to be around and stick around for that. But the audience and the consumer at this point, they still want that connection. And we do need to find ways. So all of these things that we're showing today, like normally we would be a $5 million business a year. Not this year. And I would tell you from a Canadian heritage standpoint, if it was not for the wage subsidy, if it was not for the federal rent relief, if it was not for a new factor fund that came out this year that we're the first time ever we were successful in getting some funding, Brody and I would not be here. We wouldn't be here. So even though we are a large company, guys, we we refunded, I don't want to say how much, but over seven figures when when this got canceled. So it's it's a larger company, but I would say it also hurts more too when it doesn't happen. So we do have fortunately strong ownership group and fiscal responsibility that they save for a rainy day but they were not planning for this kind of a rainy day so we did have it was it was a multi seven figure hit to this company covid-19 so but we also don't have on those years millions of dollars in talent expenses right so we didn't have that but i think the key that you you've demonstrated and you've driven this home uh, you know, as well is there's this insane appetite. Like, like I know for myself, you know, even my own mental health through this whole process, I need escape. I need, absolutely. I need something to invigorate the soul to, you know, inspire the creativity. And that's what these festivals and events, I think, you know, for at least me, and I think for many of us are really about, uh, you know, sort of an escapism piece, but also a, a, an opportunity to refill the tank. And right now, we are craving this, uh, you know, all over the place. And exactly what you're talking about, we want, and I love what you said, and I put it in the chat, I want visuals. I don't want, it's, it's like when you go to a store and you see the sign and it's like, eight pages of what you're supposed to do when you go into the store. Nobody ever reads that crap, you know? And I'm like, I want the visuals. Just show me uh, that I'm going to be safe. Allow me to not have to worry about a whole bunch of stuff, to be honest with you, and that you're going to take care of me. And I'm going to have a good time. Like, I, I love your background, John. Like, I can't wait to, like, I love to go, like, having Wanderlust just looking at that. Like, we all have a new appreciation for these things that we took maybe for granted before. Wouldn't I love to be in a crowd and have someone step on my feet and spill a beer down my back? Would love for it to have those problems, but it might be a bit. But in the meantime, I'm just say they want, people need, we as human beings, we need connection. And we are all dealing with this global trauma of a pandemic. So, the mental health side is a big the culture and community is such a big part of, of our personal mental health as well. So without having those connections, it really hurts people. And we see it, our social media team before we canceled, they didn't want to post anything. Like guys, every time I post something just saying it's sunny today or what have you, I'm getting peppered by hundreds of people saying, what's going on? What's going on? Can't wait for Cavi. Can't wait to do it. And it's their festival we put it together for them. So that's what we need to keep first is they are our reason for doing it. And what did they need? How was the world for them? And how can we interject in different points within that world and offer an experience, maybe make a buck doing it. Does and anyone else on, on here have any, any examples from what they've done, you know, over the last 11, 10, 11 months, they, them, you know, that might be of relevant for other people to hear. If you want to unmute and go, feel free. Such an engaging, come on. There's got to be somebody out there who did something really, really cool. 
Come on, tell me. Brody and I will steal it and we'll do it too. I don't, that's what we've done. That's that's our secret behind doing these sessions is we just want to take all of your ideas now and uh, we're well, that's why I attend. <laughs> that's why we all attend these things. It's, it's called acquiring best practices, right? It's you can you don't need to be the one who comes up with the idea. We saw these drive-ins happening over in Europe, but we didn't just create that one. Some of them we did. You know, and it's like, hey, it's, we can do that. It's been interesting to see uh, the evolution of this. I mean, we've been involved in, in, in a number of the festivals and event pieces, and we, we did a, a culinary one in the fall. And you know, we, we sort of laugh as we look back. It's, it's amazing what we've learned in such a short period of time. Um, you know, and Facebook Live has been uh, an amazing learning experience of uh, oh. I've seen what to do and but a sh crap load of not what to do. <laughs> and you can only get so far with bad video and bad sound. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think uh, what I have seen in the space that we're all existing in, it's incredible what has been put together now from a competitive standpoint for and we know this everyone knows this like getting somebody's uh view and eyeballs on something is even harder now because there's such insane competition uh that's going on out there but you know what we've learned is is you know is how do we how do we i guess do what we need to do that stays true to the purpose of our festival or our event and what it means to us as communities and visitors. Um, but also I think rethink some of the approaches, um, you know, and the whole virtual component piece has been a, an interesting learning that we've had through this. And I know Kim's going to talk, you know, about a little bit about what they've done on that one. Um, but it'd be interesting to hear what you guys and your experiences have been on, on that side as well. So Kim, I'll, I'll let you keep going. Maybe I know we're at uh, at eleven. We probably have another fifteen twenty minutes. So I don't know where you want to to go with uh, some of the stuff that you've done with the virtual piece as well, perhaps. Yeah. And this one we can is see what people people have for some questions for us. Perfect. So this off to the next one is this would be our, our first virtual show. So painting the picture here for you. We are now December and November into December where we would normally be announced our headliners on sale and probably a million dollars in the bank, right? Nope, not this year. And at this point we had to come out and say something. People were really looking for looking for some updates. And guys, we, we still don't know what 2021 is honestly gonna look like. I don't have a crystal ball that no one does. So even at that point we're like, hey, we know we have nothing to announce right now. We know that for sure. We're still not saying nothing will happen in 2021. There still could be a, a hybrid type of something, but it was time to come out and say here. So we had to share positioning it as bad news. Sorry, nothing for you on that front. Good news. We are still going to do something. Good news is we organized the first CBMF hangout. This one was CBMF Holiday Hangout, and there will be more of these coming up. The CBMF Holiday Hangout. Um, I did another initial, we, not everything we did is in this presentation today, but we did a brief uh, marketing test with Atlantic Lottery, where they did a promotion where you could win a private show with Brett Kissel back end of August, early September. Big success. So now we took this on. Um, we. Brett Kissel, for those of you who do know him, we selected Brett, A, he's a great Canadian artist, super fits with CBMF, but he's a great personality, right? To deliver a show. To do a virtual show, it cannot be, I would, what I would caution you is it can't be just anyone because it's not just standing there and playing your song. You need, you are it. You're the fan, you're the audience, you're the artist. They need to have some some banter. They need to have a personality. And, and he was really good. So if we didn't have Brett, we might not have done it. So what I tell you is the content is very important in the show. So we started this show. Uh, so CBMF Holiday Hangout with Brett Kissel. It wasn't just about that show. We also, again, back to the partners, is we still have a lot of partners that we need to deliver some, some engagement to. So we had, Bell was involved. Thank you very much, Bell. 
we had Atlantic Lottery came involved, but rather that it wasn't just, here's a check, put my logo on it. Atlantic Lottery was the host. One of their staff people, Abby, she was the MC and the host. We were able to incorporate uh, some videos. We do have a video I was gonna show you earlier, but I thought we might run out of time, but we may at the end, a video uh, about our partnership with Atlantic Lottery. And they were content. What they wanted to get out of it was they were looking for email acquisition. So in our pre-event promotion of this, which was the biggest objective of this was connect with our fans, connect our brands to our fans, audience to artist, but also really draw down on some value that we need to owe back these partners who have agreed to already write us a check and we still owe them some stuff. So we were able to draw down another $5,000 at a minimum on some of these partners and some other ones came on new. So folks had to enter, they had to register for the show through our CRM system, Tradable Bits. And they were also able to ask a question to Brett Kissel that he would answer in the Q&A. So the show was 30 minutes of Brett, 15 minutes of Q&A. If you submitted a question, you were automatically entered to win one of our 20 gift bags, uh, holiday gift bags that we hand delivered to folks and social media and everything. So the pre-promotion was just, was more so than the actual show. So we had 1800 people enter and register. We did the 20 gift bags that were filled with awesome swag with our partners and some partners in there that uh, weren't big, big sponsors, but one would say, say Country Liberty. Don't know if you all are familiar with them, but Sawyer over there, Country Liberty is one of our favorites. We took him under our wing. He came on as a merchandising partner a few years ago. Sawyer at Country Liberty presented on Dragon's Den this year, grew his company so much, mentioned his partnership with Cavendish Beach Music Festival and how that took off and got a deal with the Dragons. So we don't, we're still waiting for a commission check, Brody, but I'm sure it's in the mail. But uh, so it was like trying to, how can we work with our partners to make them successful? And that's why they stick with us. So we're all, this show, we don't want a 30 second ad saying, here's, I'm just selling my stuff. Everyone who was involved had to send us custom content. So we had a video, if we have time at the end, Jonathan and I were back and forth with it. I will play it. Um, but a bit of a, uh, some videos from them. We also had Tito's was a partner and not just talking about vodka, but this is holiday time. The show was took place on December 28th. So our social media team went to one of the restaurants, made a drink with the Tito's. We created a video for it that went into the video and then also was links out. Here's the recipe. So again, not just go to the liquor store and buy Tito's, but incorporating that into the product of the show. You see that in TV shows and movies now. How do you incorporate the brand into the product a little more naturally? So also on that form, say from a partnership of Atlantic Lottery, they were, you know, big thing for them was digital and email ac uh, acquisition. So there was an opt-in. Well, if you sign up, you could choose to say, if you were 19 plus, and then choose to opt in to hear from Atlantic Lottery if you wanted. Like, I, I'm just curious, I need to know. What percentage do you think that people said, sure, I'll agree to hear from Atlantic Lottery? Like, throw me some guesses of what you think it might have been. Throw out some numbers. Jonathan will report back. 3%. Three, yeah. 6, we got. 52%. Wow. 52%. And what I can tell you guys is there's partners out there right now willing to pay $5 per new email you can get them. Boom, easy money. So some of these things aren't necessarily a big product. It's I have an audience. There's people who want access to that audience, but the audience doesn't want us to be sold. They want to like give me a value, offer me something, and I will give you my golden cross, which is my email address to spam me into the future. So that was a big win for them. And we were able to get some good engagement and we didn't need to pay a host. They did it and we got some great content from it. So that was like one example of involving some of those partners. So then we had 600 people watch the show guys. So yeah, I wish it was 1800, but it was December 28th. There's some learnings. We were in between Christmas and new year, that area where nobody knows what day it is. And I thought we've all been dealing with that for eight months, that it wouldn't have been such a thing where we're all dealing for the last few months of what day is it? And am I still in my pajamas? That 
and we thought there would be more. So we were kind of disappointed at the ones who actually tuned in, but we did learn as well as on the communication side is we should have sent an email reminder the day before, which we didn't. If we did that, we think we would have had more of a turnout. Um, but we were really, really happy with that. We're definitely gonna do it again. The CRM system that we use, um, we've used that for contest entries, but as well as for the live stream. So we did not use Facebook Live. We looked at a whole bunch of different tools. The tools, I uh, spent way too much time looking at the tools. Jonathan and I have talked about this a lot is it's all over the place on the tools from free to $100,000 and there's everything in between. You can go take the bus or you can go buy a Cadillac. And some of them are completely unnecessary and of the, of the items that are in there. But for example, if you're, using, if you're doing music at all, you cannot use Facebook Live. 95% guarantee you'll get shut down in the middle of your event, even if it's a cover band. The algorithm will just shut you down. And I've talked to many people where they're in the middle of even just a small conference with a few, uh, few people on it, they were using Facebook Live, they played a song that was unlicensed and immediately shut down. So I would caution if you're using anything with music or uh, movie clips or anything, do not use Facebook Live where you're taking a very likely a risk of getting shut down. So we ended up choosing a company called Fan XP, which is an offshoot of our CRM system of tradable bits. What we liked about that is the engagement side. We didn't want just to throw up the video and have people sit back and watch. We wanted to be able to show pre-videos. There's a staging room. We can communicate back. There's this post-event survey capability. We can put up banner ads at certain points. So there was one point when I got the show back from Brett where it appeared live, but it was live to tape. Uh, when I got the show back from Brett, he naturally, he was talking about his show that's on Crave, his drive-in show on Crave. Well, that wasn't scripted, but he did. Well, Bell is a big partner, so we talked to Bell and say, hey, Brett happens to mention his thing on Crave. Send me a graphic and we'll promote, sign up for Crave, get your free 30 days, because he's mentioning it organically as part of the show. So they sent us a graphic. We put it up at that point. We got two clicks, nothing significant. But again, it goes back to the offer to the part. Give them a chance to say no. Give them a chance to say, I can't turn it around. By just communicating and letting them know, here's another opportunity for you. And I'm not, oh, I'm not going to charge you anything more for that. But it's a great little value to add. And just by showing that you're thinking about them and coming back to, here's some other things I can do. They really appreciate that and come back to us with more awesome ideas. So we did a survey at the end of it. And as expected, because we could tell in the chat, people were really, really happy with it. We would absolutely do it again. Tons of learnings that we got, mainly on how we would lay out certain things, where people click, logistics type of stuff. Um, our social team was on managing it. There was a lot of great interactive chats, exactly what we wanted it for. The sponsors were really happy and thrilled. Um, we were able to get some great content that we can use into the future. And we're absolutely it's in our business plans to do again. It's going to give you a little bit of a little bit of a preview here. Brody and I have a very important award ceremony to attend this afternoon because our virtual our virtual event, our holiday hang it with Brett Kissel, uh, won an award for best free live stream event for 2020 on the platform. This platform is used by a lot of NBA teams as well. So it's not just a little thing, like we're up against um, the Spurs and stuff of different things that they've done. Um, so we were selected by the company as the best stream live stream event on their platform. And it was because of the show itself and incorporating partners, the engagement strategy on, the survey after. So the whole process, there's more to it on the virtual than just the show. And what I would share with you on that is there's so many opportunities. You don't have to get your talent. Brett Kissel did it from BC, but even doing it live. Uh, I would love to do something with Jillian Harris and have her come pipe in live and talk about jelly mugs for anyone on here that knows what I'm talking about. So that is, there's lots of opportunities here that you can get in your audience is not just limited to a geography anymore. What was the uh, what was the platform again? Fan XP is that what it was? Fan XP is what we used. Yeah. 
the annex be okay? And there's a there's a bunch of them out there. Um, when we went and we look like hop in is another one that I really like. Hop in, uh, we're looking at we'll get into like some hybrid for CBMF proper 2021 is the platform I'm looking for because we could do virtual sponsorship rooms. I can do augmented reality and it's great for a large festival for a smaller type of stuff. It's overkill. So it's, it's quite expensive, but it's very engaging. So we just can't afford it yet. So we would love to be able to use those more experiential type of tools, but they're, they're just still quite expensive. So we're, we're at about a uh, quarter after. Um, okay. there's, there's a few more things that uh, we might come back to this video, Kim, but I, I just want to open it up here and see if we've got anybody, if we've sparked some questions on anybody that they want to ask, or if you want Kim and I to charge forward sort of uh, with a few sort of closing component pieces. Um, but open it up for some questions or feedback or comments on what you have done uh, would be great. Or I'm going to start picking at random here and making making you talk to me. Oh. <laughs> Listen, like I had a prize here, but I don't know. <laughs> I think um, this is Susie from Barrington. <clears throat> um, we've done a lot of virtual events um, to for our festivals that we've had to cancel. Um, and while it, it did get a lot of engagement and, and they were successful in terms of virtual events, you just don't get the revenue from those. And I know you were, spoke to, you you had sponsors for your events and we're not, a, you know, huge festival um, and and didn't kind of approach it from that perspective of, of sponsorship for our virtual events last year. Now, I'll probably look at it a little bit different this year um, because it is kind of looking that <laughs> uh, looking that way for, for some of our events that we won't be able to host them to the capacity that we're used to um, hosting them. So you can while it was good for one year, it's it's hard to sustain a festival and event on virtual events that don't bring in actual revenue. So, okay, uh, yeah, I will let you know. Um, and Brody may be upset with me sharing some of these numbers, but that's okay. Won't be the first time. We've made we made almost twenty thousand dollars on this virtual show after nice. expenses, profit. That's paying the band. That's paying production. That's paying everything. Mm -hmm. Close to twenty grand. Right. That's not a giant amount of money and on scale of what we normally would do, but for this year, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that, yeah, we're what I'm, we're looking for. At, what I've seen in the research is people on the consumer level really don't want to pay for the content. We've mm -hmm. talked to other events. Um, you know, I work with my colleagues across the country often as well. And you know, City Folk Festival did a virtual did a virtual event on the same platform, and they charged fifteen dollars nominal fee. Had significantly reduced people actually paying to do it. So on the revenue side, the partners, the sponsors, they will pay for that access and for more so then an audience member would give you $5 for virtual. People mm -hmm. just don't, and some have had success, but on a, the grand swath, people don't want to pay for content. We asked mm -hmm. in the survey, we asked people, would you pay and what would you pay to support the artist now? Because we did position it in supporting the artist mm -hmm. and they would pay, a, some would pay five, 10, 20 would be the max, but about half didn't want to pay anything. So mm -hmm. they said they might pay a few bucks, uh, and every, again, everyone's different, but that's what we have learned in some research that we've done is we right now we want to try to not pay ticket, we still have to ticket everything, but not a paid ticket wherever mm -hmm. we can, because then it just makes it a, a larger audience and then the sponsor will pay more because they can reach more people. Mm -hmm. That was that's been our experience. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I think, you know, just based on the, the, you know, the process we went through in, in gross more and with a number of the different festivals and events <clears throat> kind of the same things Susie we, we we made no money off of the virtual ones you know we we 
I think we took pride in the fact that we were able to deliver something. Um, but after the fact, I think we started to rethink. What we did is we basically stayed with the same process that we had done, whether it was a, a live event or not, and tried to overlay the virtual component into it versus actually rethinking. Um, and this goes back to, I, I think, having to take a deeper dive on what your sponsors need to get and what you need to, to deliver. Uh, not just trying to ram the same process into a virtual uh, festival. So how do you actually, once again, staying true to the purpose of, of why your festival or event exists, rethink or reimagine um, that process? Because just putting a, a camera and a piece of sound equipment in front of somebody on a stage, as I said, we, it was so funny when Paul Gudgeon had, had we had him uh, last fall and he says like, look, says for nine dollars uh, a month i can get uh you know every concert in europe beamed into my uh you know home in scotland with every one of these artists like how are you with you know incredible video quality and and all of these things how are you going to to compete against that you know and there is this piece of community and i think what kim has done well today is, is how you communicate what it is you're trying to accomplish and what it means to you know, whether it's Barrington or whether it's, you know, uh, the greater Prince Edward Island area uh, to ensure that your your fans, your consumers are buying into this, but also rethinking and reimagining. Like we just had a conversation last night on uh, the Tales, Trails and Tunes Festival, which is sort of the kickoff in Newfoundland, you know, for the for the tourism season, which happens in in May. And, you know, and it was trying to ram the same thing into a sort of virtual approach. And we're like, does that make any sense any longer? And all of a sudden, this creativity started coming up of, okay, if we're going to go and ask sponsors to come into this thing, what are we going to give them? You know, and, and we started talking about, what if we created a, a shed series? And we actually pre-taped these, because, you know, having shed parties in Newfoundland is, you know, we're kitchen parties. But what would it look like to have these pre-taped um, sort of thematic shed uh, sessions scattered around the community? And it was incredible all of a sudden it got people thinking outside of, okay, we just don't need to go to the lines then put somebody up on a stage and try to, you know, socially distance a uh, hundred people type of thing. And I think these are the things we need to think about. And what I've taken from Kim as well is rethinking what we're offering to our sponsors is, is really, really key and how we see them as partners. And I, I love what you said there, Kim, like sometimes we just see them as bell or rbc or you know td up on a banner you know and they cut us a check for five grand and and i think we need to move beyond that and really engage them in, in those types of conversations because bell has been phenomenal i don't know how much content they've come to us asking we need content we need content because yeah. you're absolutely right you get 15,000 eyeballs on a, an eight-year-old or 10-year-old TV show they produced, you know, in, versus the 98,000. And what did they do? Like, it's a minimal investment from Bell's side of things. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's incredible what you can do. So I just think that rethink that we might have to um, put into it. And once again, it's this evolution that we, we have to look at with our festivals and events. So other questions or feedback? Cool. I'm going to let Kim sum up where she wants to go here then. Sure. We'll just kind of wrap up here. It's like we're into 2021 and where do we go? We just went over what we did. Where do we think things are going to go? Again, no crystal ball, but likely a combination of digital as well as hybrid combination of in-person and digital experiences. Uh, In-person, of course, wherever safe. We're looking at doing small gatherings, but across larger spaces, spreading cohorts around neighborhood blocks and bringing folks together virtually that way. Again, to reiterate, safety front and center, get that into your heads that that needs to be part of your A plan, marketing communications plan. Creating opportunities in these more micro moments for partners to personalize things as much as possible. We are taking this year to really grow our CRM and our marketing reach. And we're doing other things too. So 
Um, this was a busy week. I'll tell you around here. We are, you know, we're working on a winter festival for this year with a DMO, which will be announced next week, mostly outdoors. It's going to be a, you know, a month of very fun activities on PEI. And just yesterday, we submitted a proposal for a, to another DMO to develop another festival for late spring. And there's a lot more ideas in the hopper that I'm not allowed to talk about just yet. Uh, but 2022 and post COVID, I just had to put this in as we're a bunch of mayor timers. Is guys, it's gonna be a time. It's gonna be a time when we come out of this, the pent up demand to get out and enjoy live mass gatherings together is is going to be insurmountable. We are all gonna have a great year. We're hoping it's 2022, but whenever that is, it's we well, let's get ready and. Like we are, and I'm sure you guys are as well, is using this time to get ready for that. Let's have do that redefining, having those conversations, throwing things up at the wall and see what sticks. Even if it doesn't happen this time around, well, maybe in another couple of months it will. So rules are changing all of the time. Keep coming back to who you are and your purpose, like marketing 101, right? That is still... You are still the community of Sackville, New Brunswick, and that's not changed. You're like, that's where you are. Our venue is in Cavendish, and that's where it is. How do we make that pride of place and the sharing of that community and still connect to those folks? So we're still going to come up with more ideas. Um, we will be participating in more things like this, as many things as Jonathan will let us in on to learn from and learning from each other. And because uh, what I love to see out of this is so many more of these types of things happening where we can all share our lessons learned. And just because someone did it first doesn't mean you can't do it better. Take all of these to any of these things here. I, I hope you did get something out of it today that that sparked some some thoughts. And really, that was our goal of let's have a conversation. Let's start looking at things a little bit differently. What was is is not the same. Things have changed. Tokens are probably gone. Handshaking is probably gone for, for our near future. But globalization and technology is here. Upselling experiences is still there. Adoption of tech. So there's still a lot of opportunities that, you know, make that lemonade out of the lemons that we have. So, and, and we really do try to take that approach. And, and I would encourage you to as well, as long as you know, it is tough sometimes when you get down in the weeds and you feel frustrated that you just can't do what you want to do. But to try and uh, it was like we're all in this together at the end of the day and, and to help each other. Hopefully we're, we'll have an Atlantic bubble and we will all be sharing the same customers into 2021 and 2022. Um, so that's pretty much it for the, for the, for the sake of time as well. That, that's all I really have for today. And I just wanted to leave you with a couple of shots of some nostalgia. Look at people touching hands and drinking and sitting in chairs beside each other. Look at this couple. Someone's talking into someone's ear. One guy doesn't even have a shirt on. <laughs> so it's someday, someday soon, we hope that we can all be like this and have a beer spilled down our back and someone stepping on our toes as we cheer on our favorite band and create some magical memories together. So the next time we open, I invite you all to come. Please come to the next Cavendish Beach Music Festival. I just can't tell you when that will be. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. That was awesome uh, as always. Uh, so much information. Uh, you know, there. I think there's so much to, to chew on there that we could have dove. As you said, you could keep going and going go and going. I could, keep, I, could, I could keep listening and listening and listening because, you know, to me, there's, there's so many um, different opportunities that we can take advantage of uh, coming out of this. And, and I think you're right. This tsunami of opportunity in 2022, um, this, is the, uh, this is the time to be thinking about, you know, and testing and putting into practice some of these uh, pieces, but also thinking creatively about what is it that I, how could I evolve my festival or event for, for what's going to, you know, come at us in, in 2022. This is our business plan that just got packaged this morning that we are presenting to the owners tomorrow for 2021. There's a lot. 
but we're not going to sit around and do nothing. We still have a lot planned. Um, Kim, I had somebody ask me about if they wanted to see if you wanted to show your video. Oh, we can show that we got. I know we're hyping this video up like it's like a Michael Bay. <laughs> I don't know now. Let me. Just... Uh, let me just get my share going here. Share screen. So this video I'm um, queuing up here is, uh, it's from Taken at the Drive-In. And this is a video that Atlantic Lottery put together as one of our partners. And it it's with our president, Jeff Squires, and just talking about the partnership and how important uh, it really was for us to produce something um, as well as with our partners. Mm. Are you seeing that share? Can you see that for him play? Okay. Yep. All right. Yeah, it's all good. This event is about community. This is an event about PEI. This is an event about supporting local musicians and artists in a very trying year. We're used to hosting 25, 27, 28,000 people here over three days on a, on a nightly basis. And, and if you look here behind you, there's 300 to 400 cars. And uh, yeah, it's considerably different and it's considerably downscaled. But let's not take away from what's going on in the stage. And that's great local entertainment, which Cavendish Beach Music Festival has prided itself from being a platform to help emerging artists uh, grow and get exposure. The support we receive from sponsors, these things don't happen without sponsors and community-minded businesses and organizations who, who continue to see the value and put their resources and their sponsorship dollars behind these things because they know the impact that it has on, on our culture. And I think what it does, it just continues to solidify those relationships that we are working in partnership uh, to create the great place that we know is, is, is Prince Edward Island. I think the impact in our community is it, it's, it's hope it's resilience, uh, it's a feel good, and it gives people a break. People are feeling that they get out for a Saturday night again and, and are enjoying their friends and their family and their camaraderie and being in a spot where it's part of our culture here in PEI with the musicians and the artists on the North Shore, and it feels pretty normal and it feels feels pretty uh, summerish, which I think people have all been looking forward to. That's cool. the the Oscar winning video that we were all waiting on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you once again, Kim, um, uh, for sharing all of that information. And uh, if anyone, uh, you know, has any questions or anything like that, if you if you flip them through to me, uh, you know, I can follow up with Kim to see if there's anything that we can respond back to you on. Um, there's still a few spots in next week's session. Uh, once again, it's it's interesting. It actually builds a little bit off of of this one. So we have Chef Alain Bosse. Who uh, who utilized uh, you know sort of this pivot to using the the sort of virtual approach to uh, his culinary side of things, and it's insane how the sponsorship side has taken up uh, for him and what he what it's meant to his business uh, moving forward. So that's next week, um, and then we'll open up the uh, following one uh, next Wednesday as well. If you go on, you'll see the list there. So there's uh, six on there and there's two more that I'll be adding uh, next week. Uh, one's on uh, mountain biking and fat biking. And the other one's on the opportunity of trails and what it could mean to your community going forward as well. So those will be in March. Once again, thank you everyone. I uh, hope to have uh, the video of this up and on our site as well. We'll do a little bit of editing on it. Um, but thanks for being part of our, our initial kickoff of this in 2021. Hope to see you on uh, some more of these in, in the near future. And once again, thanks, Kim. Thank you, everyone. It was fun. Take care, folks. <laughs>